Okay, if you missed class um, within the past two days, we've started our new unit on chemical reactions, and this is going uh, to be uh, tab number five in your binder, which we call chemical reactions. And you can abbreviate reactions as Rx and S if you like, because um, I know those tabs are a little hard to write on. Now, this unit is all about the things that we think of when we think of chemistry, right? You think of chemistry and you think about mixing chemical equations and, uh, or excuse me, mixing chemicals and making things blow up. And if you did miss today's class, we did the methane mamba, and, aka we lit your hands on fire in class. And so it's uh, very sad that you missed it. But I'm sure you can check it out on those videos that people were Snapchatting during class. It was very exciting. Now, chemical equations. Okay, chemical equations are how we represent reactions, okay, because we need to be able to kind of, through the written form, explain what's happening. And a chemical equation is similar to a recipe, okay? You have ingredients and you make your products. Now, Thanksgiving was recent, and for Thanksgiving, my thing that I make for my family is apple pie. Now, the ingredients for an apple pie in order to make it, is you need a crust. Now, I make mine homemade, but you can buy them from the store. You need a crust. You need some apples. And you need some spices. Now, this is a, obviously a very abbreviated version of an apple pie, but that's the general gist of an apple pie. Now, this is one way that I wrote it as a list, but you could also say that a crust plus apples plus spices produces a pie, okay? Now, this is telling us the exact same thing, where this everything on the left side of our, our arrow is our ingredients, and the pie is our product, right? That is what we... Produced and, and this arrow right here literally means to produce or to yield. So anytime you kind of hear that phrase, you can think in your head, okay, arrow. And so we see this going on. Now if we look at our back to our guided notes, it says in a chemical equation, we call the ingredients reactants. So in a chemical equation, for example, so for example, our NaCl, NaCl plus um, water would produce uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Now, with this, if our ingredients are on the left side of our arrow, then we know the ingredients for this reaction are our reactants on the left side. And our products, okay, which is what we form, we form is called our product, okay, they're on the right side. So these words are the same, but we can think of the word ingredients as a the more scientific term for that would be reactants, okay? And reactants and products can come in various physical states. Uh, for instance, you could add melted butter, which would be a liquid to a recipe, or sometimes they call for a solid butter. Now, we know that our other type of phase that we've discussed in class is gases, so you can have solid, liquid, or gases, um, and I'm not sure what's right here on your notes, but we can get rid of that, okay? And so when we indicate what type of phase it is, it's important to make sure we look at our symbols. Now, the first thing is a solid, and a solid is going to be represented by the letter S. Now, notice that this has parentheses. That's very important because the gas is represented by the letter P, the lowercase p with parentheses. So, lowercase p with parentheses means a gas. But if I have a G all by itself, that means grams, right? So, it's very important that you actually include those parentheses. You can't just put the lowercase letter G and be done with it. Now, liquid is obviously going to be L, which is represented by letter D. And the last one, 
The only letter we have left is A. And this is an aqueous solution, which our AQ makes sense. But the question is, is what does the word aqueous mean? What does this word mean? And it means a solid dissolves in water. Okay, well, usually a solid. It can occasionally be a gas. It's a solid dissolves in water. Now, aqueous is how we pronounce it, or aqueous. Uh, people say it both ways, but it sounds similar to aqua. And we know that aqua is a prefix for water. So it's just referring to solid dissolved in water. So if we think of, again, NaCl, which we know is table salt, normally when we put it on our french fries, it's a solid. But we also know that when we go to the beach, we actually have NaCl that's aqueous because it's salt that's been dissolved in the water. That's why we have salt water. So that's really all that that means there. And when we look at the next part, saying, can you identify the states? Pause the video and take a moment to write down uh, what the state of each compound is in these lines right here. Okay, so you pause the video, you wrote them down. Let's go over it. This G tells me that ammonia is going to be a gas. The L tells me that water is going to be a liquid. And the AQ for both ammonium and hydroxide tell me that they're both aqueous solutions. So we had very different things um, in our reactants and different things in our product. Keep in mind that my reactant is everything on the left side. And all my products is what's on the right side. And it would appear that I jumped the gun on that because it asks you that right here. Okay, You need to be able to identify reactant and product in the chemical equation. This will be on your quiz and on your test for this unit. You might even see it show up on your final exam. So it's very important that you be able to do that skill. So let's move on. Okay, well, we know how to read a chemical equation now, but we need to look at what is actually happening. And so our reactants are mixed. And when a chemical reaction occurs, the atoms get rearranged. Okay, that's very important. I'm going to put my star there, which means you need to know that for your quiz or test. Okay, so we need to think, okay, what is happening in this picture. Okay. Notice we have three different ways of representing this reaction. We have it with pictures with the different circles representing the atoms. We have it in words and we also have it in symbols as the third one. Okay. Now we know that if our symbol is CH4 which must mean methane and I have only one of them, we have one carbon and four hydrogens. That must mean the black atom in the center is carbon, and these four white atoms surrounding it must be hydrogen. And so if we look, right, and our arrow is kind of splitting our reaction down to the before the reaction and the after the reaction, we don't really see much of the in between or the process, but before the hydrogens are attached to the carbon and afterwards they're actually attached to these oxygens. And so what that means is that these hydrogen bonds here had to have been broken with the carbon and they had to have been reformed with these oxygens. So we have the breaking and forming of new bonds. Okay, so we can just add that breaking and forming of new bonds. Okay. But we also notice that it's just kind of, they're moving around, right? The individual atoms on the reactant side and the product side, they're not disappearing or appearing from nowhere, but they're just 
kind of moving around. They're changing places, right? And so the key there is that the atoms are rearranged, okay? They're not coming from anywhere um, except what is in the reactants. So if we want to count the number of oxygen atoms on the reactant side, we want to count, okay, how many do I have on both the reactant side and the product side? I see here that I have one, two, three, four oxygen atoms, and I can confirm that by saying two times two gives me four on my reactant side, and I have two oxygen atoms here, and two times my one oxygen gives me two, so two plus two is four. And I can also count my red spheres, one, two, three, four. So I see that I have four oxygen atoms on both sides. Now let's kind of get rid of that so we can look at some of the other atoms that we have here to look at, some of the new elements. If we look at the next one, they want to know about carbon, okay? Now carbon is the black atom, and I, whenever there's no prefix, it's kind of like a one. Chemists are lazy. We don't write one. So there's one carbon on both sides, and we can see that with our black spheres here. We have one on the reactant side and one on the product side. So we can go ahead and fill that in in our worksheet. And then last but certainly not least is the hydrogen atoms. Now the hydrogen atoms are the white circles, and so we can count them. Um, let's go ahead and pick a different color. You can say one, two, three, four. But we can also see that this subscript four tells me that I have four on my reactant side. And if I look at my products, say I can again count the white circles. But I can also look at my coefficient multiplied by my subscript, 2 times 2 gives me 4. And so what we notice is, look, on both the reactant side and the product side, my numbers stayed the same. So they stayed the same. And this is extremely important, and it obeys a particular law that we know about, okay? In every chemical equation, the atoms must be the same on both sides, okay? That's going to be key for us. And it's because of this law of conservation of matter, which we've talked about in class, the law of conservation of matter, since almost the very first day of school. And it states that matter, okay, which we know is made up of atoms, cannot be created or destroyed. But we do know the only thing that can happen is that atoms can be rearranged. So let's add that to our definition. So matter or atoms cannot be created or destroyed. They can only be rearranged. Now, just for your corny chemistry joke of the day, I hear you should never trust an atom. They make up everything. Ha! I knew you would love it. Laugh away, you're watching the video, so you won't have to pretend like you're acting cool in front of people. But let's look at the next part, okay? Which of the compounds in the equation is one of the seven diatomic molecules? Okay, so let's break down what's happening. So there's seven of something in the diatomic molecule. Now, the prefix di, we know means two, and atomic is probably talking about atoms. And so molecules, so it's a molecule made up of two atoms. So if we look here, this molecule, CH4, has one carbon and four hydrogens. So this has a total of five atoms. Now five atoms is not two atoms. So that is not our diatomic molecule. Let's look at the next one. This oxygen molecule has only two atoms there, so it could be the one we're referring to. Notice we're not including our coefficients here. We're only looking at our subscripts when we're looking at the number of atoms in a molecule. Uh, the number two as our coefficient, that number in front, is actually just referring to how many molecules of it we have. 
Um, so let's move on and see if we can eliminate all of the other ones as well. If we look at CO2, we have one carbon and two oxygens. That's a total of three atoms, which uh, means we cannot be diatomic. And if we look at the last one, we have one oxygen and two hydrogens, which again is three atoms, which eliminates that. So that must mean that oxygen or O2 is our diatomic element, uh, diatomic molecule, excuse me. Now remember that these diatomic molecules, they're just elements on the chemical, uh, the periodic table that always operate in pairs when found in nature. And so if we want to list the other diatomic molecules, okay, and there are seven of them, we use the word Hofbrinkel to help us remember what they are. And if we were to pronounce the word Hofbrinkel, Hof would start with an H O F, right? Hofbrinkel, B R I N C L. Hofbrinkel. And so that is the symbols that represent the elements that are the diatomic molecules. So if we look at capital letter H, capital letter H diatomically would be H2, and that is hydrogen gas. If we look at O, we've already talked about it's oxygen, and it's oxygen when it's in the gas form. All of these diatomic molecules are going to be gases. And the capital letter F represents fluorine, which would be fluorine gas. The capital, we have a capital B and a lowercase r, which tells me they're together, and that would be bromine. The letter I represents iodine. Now, if you look on your periodic table, you'll notice that a majority of these gases are in your halogen family, um, and that's going to be true of them. Is the gases kind of on that second row of the periodic table and kind of down your halogen family are going to be where a majority of your diatomic elements are. Um, the N is going to represent nitrogen gas, and Cl, at the lowercase l, will be fluorine gas. Okay, so it's very, very important that you memorize these seven diatomic elements. They'll be showing up over and over again throughout the year. Now, they ask us what the physical states of all the compounds in the reaction. We see all of these G's in parentheses here, and so we know that they were all gases. Okay, and so if we look at our coefficients, right, we had a 2 in front of the oxygen and a 2 in front of the water. These are called coefficients, okay, and coefficients help us to balance out the number of atoms on both sides, and we want to get a little bit of practice with balancing, okay. So we're going to do these two sample problems, and then we're going to call it a day and learn about the rest um, in the next class or the next video. But what you do first is we kind of draw a line on our um, arrows there, and that just kind of helps us remember, okay, we're looking at one side versus the other side. They're not combined yet. And we look at how many different elements we have in this compound. So we have a capital P and a capital O. That means we only have two elements, P, B, and O, and it's on both sides. And the next thing we do is we count up, okay, how many do I have? Well, I have one lead right here, and I have two oxygens. And on the right side, I have one lead atom, and I have two oxygens here and one oxygen there. So when we add them together, we get a total of three oxygens. Okay, and this is not balanced. I have one on each side of my leads, but on my reactant side I have two uh, oxygen atoms, and on the right side I have three. Where did that third oxygen atom come from? It can't come from nowhere, so we need to balance out our reactant. If we look at this, we see that my oxygen here is kind of unpaired. 
and that makes it tricky to work with. When you have oxygen split like that, you want to make sure that you get them into an even number. Now, if I put the coefficient 2 here, okay, the number 2 is your coefficient, in this case the number 2, is always multiplied to every element inside that molecule. So 2 times my 1 lead will give me 2 leads, and 2 times my 1 oxygen will give me 2 right here, plus these two over here, so that really changes it to four. Now this is beneficial to us because even though our leads are not balanced, we now are dealing with an even number here and an even number here, which is always a lot easier to manipulate. And so if we look over on our reactant side, in order to make our leads balance out now, we need to put a two right here. And two times my one lead give me 2, and 2 times my 2 oxygens give me 4. And so by balancing out my lead, I balanced out my oxygens at the exact same time. Now, with this blank spot here, we can either leave it blank or we can put a 1, because 1 times 2 will not change the answer at all. It's still remaining at 4 total oxygens with the other coefficients um, included in there. Now, if we look at number two, number two has mercury, HG, and oxygen, which is an O. It has solid uh, mercury oxide turning into liquid mercury and oxygen gas. Now, we need to count how many I have of each. I have one mercury and one oxygen. I have one mercury and two oxygens. Now, to balance out my oxygens, because the mercuries are already balanced, I can put a 2 here, because I know that 2 times my 1 oxygen will give me 2, but it also affects the mercury. 2 times 1 is 2. So now I go to my product side and I say, okay, I can't just magically make that 2, but I can add another mercury atom there, and 2 times 1 will give me 2. And my mercuries are balanced, my oxygens are balanced and I am ready to go and move on to the next problem.